start. Fantastic. So we'll discuss some challenging cases, um, some that are from our institution and, and many from Dr. Adai's institution in Ghana. Um, and they will include anterior and posterior urethral reconstruction. And we are coming uh, to you from Seattle, Washington in the United States. So we have five hospitals in our system here in Seattle. Um, but we mostly work at our major trauma center, which is called Harborview. And Harborview is right outside of downtown in the city. We're in Washington. So if you look at the map in the bottom right, this is the United States. And Washington is up in the top left corner of the map. So we're in the far northwest um, near, the, near Canada and near the ocean, Pacific Ocean. The blue area there is all of the states that our hospital serves. So we serve a five state region that makes up about a fifth of the landmass of the United States and has about three to 5% of the total population in the United States. Um, top image just shows you kind of a map of the US again. And then on the left is our, um, is our uh, the outside of the building we're in right now at Harborview. And there are, over 200 trauma centers, so hospitals that also treat um, acute injuries and issues after injuries that all um, uh, serve the region in blue. And ultimately, Harborview is kind of the end of the line there, the highest level for the sickest patients or the people that have the most complicated issues um, make their way over to see us. And when the patient usually comes in for any kind of urethral um, issues, it doesn't matter if it's trauma related or radiation related or catheter trauma or just um, idiopathic, um, they usually, before they see us in clinic, at least, they get um, a retrograde urethrogram. And you, it's usually done by our radiologists. We do have the capability to do this here in clinic as well. And we inject contrast and then take x-rays. And I would love to know how all of this happens in Ghana, if you have the capability of getting imaging for your patients. The other option would be to look in with a scope. And we have tiny little scopes that are um, very, very thin that we can sometimes traverse tighter strictures. I think Dr. Adai may have dropped off. It's okay. One thing that came up too was, um, was what are some of the landmarks for your retrograde urethrogram and for your urethral imaging? And there are a few important things that I think help can guide you. I will go back and forth across a couple slides here, but on the bottom right is a diagram of the different parts of the urethra. So between the red lines is the prostate and the prostatic urethra. There are two purple lines here that show the membranous urethra. And those two are the posterior urethra. Um, and I'm a, I apologize if any of this is review for you all. Um, the blue is the bulbar urethra and the yellow is the penile urethra with the, the meatus and the fossa navicularis, the end of the penile urethra is in green here. So from the blue all the way to the tip of the penis, the green is the anterior urethra. And there are a couple helpful landmarks. The bones are great landmarks. The deflection of the urethra and the penis by some of the supportive attachments also can serve as landmarks. So that's including the GU diaphragm, which sits around the bulbomembranous junction. So right around let me see if I can get our annotation tool right around where my red dot is here is the geodiaphragm. And then also the suspensory ligament of the penis on the diagram that's shown here, that attaches at the junction between the bulbar and the penile urethra. And without the penis on much stretch in this uh, urethrogram, we can see the deflection of the suspensory ligament right about here. And so the straight penile urethra, and then that sigmoid curve, bulbar urethra behind it. Um, if you're trying to get an estimate of measurement of the length, I've found that if you have a, um, a hemostat, the eyelets of the hemostats, the finger holds on the hemostat 
um, measure around two centimeters on the inside of them. So if you put one up and get an X-ray of it, it can give you a rough way to, to estimate the length of your stricture. And when we measure the length, we go from the end of healthy stuff to the end of healthy stuff on the other side, not from just the narrowest to narrowest, but where we think is healthy to where we think is healthy. And many times, the if you don't read those studies often, um, the sphincter can be deceiving because it looks like here there might be a complete obliteration where no contrast goes up. But this is really right where the patient's sphincter is. And um, this stricture is more in the bulbar urethra right here. You can see the narrowing. And most likely, if the patient hasn't had any operations on the prostate or no pelvic fracture, the, the posterior urethra is most likely intact. Um, sometimes we need to assess it. Um, but most likely it's intact and you only can see no contrast because there's a sphincter and the patient is, is not letting the, the contrast pass because uh, they, they might be squeezing the sphincter at the time of the exam. This just shows you those landmarks as well. You can see the prostatic urethra in red and we can see a little shadow that's the virum montanum where the ejaculatory ducts this enter the prostate. We see the, sorry, we see in yellow, the GU diaphragm and that bulbomembranous junction. We can see the sphincter pinching close the urethra right here. And then in blue is where the suspensory ligament would attach. And we can tell because of the deflection of the urethra there. One question came up of, you know, how successful are endoscopic treatments? So when a stricture is found, if you look in with the camera and use an, an endoscopic blade to perform a urethrotomy, um, or if you use dilators, either a balloon or rigid dilators to stretch the area of scar. And this was looked at um, by Dr. Santucci's group. Dr. Santucci used to be a, a major trauma center in Detroit in the uh, central United States. Um, and among all comers, they found that if you followed patients out several years, the success rates were pretty poor. And especially if you did multiple treatments. So if somebody, somebody may get one treatment with an endoscopic surgery, but if it, their scar returns, two, three, more than that, probably won't solve their problem. Um, there's a role for this treatment in the strictures in the bulbar urethra, but in the penis, um, it's generally not our go-to because even on the first go, it is not likely to cure the problem in the penis. So when they looked over everything, they saw somewhere between a six and 8% success rate overall when you follow the patients out five, 10, 15 years from their endoscopic treatment. And then we have a, an algorithm that we can follow for patients with anterior strictures. And it, it all depends, and that's why we get the imaging on the location of the stricture. So whether it is at the meatus or the, the fossa, or it's the penis urethra or the bulbar urethra, or sometimes we see it spanning the entire bulbar penile urethra, including the medial um, meatus and the fossa, a panurethral stricture. Um, in that algorithm, we, we have it divided to those three categories. And um, you know, the, the medial fossa strictures, they kind of are mostly related to a disease called lichen sclerosis, which can respond to steroid treatment. Um, but if dilations and the meatotomy, just opening up the meatus more fail, then a urethral reconstruction is important. And that can be done with putting in a graft from under the tongue, a tongue graft or a buccal graft. Um, it depends how long that fossa is or, or structure, structure is. And then the penile urethra, as we said, no dilation should be done. I think only in an emergency, potentially you could dilate, but a DVIU, an incision into that area is dangerous because the sponge around that urethra and the penis is very thin. So you could uh, on accident incise and then go through the sponge and into the corpora and have major bleeding. Um, so the penis urethra should be reconstructed and, and usually if there's a longer stricture, you do not wanna excise it and put it back together, but you wanna place a graft. 
And the reason is that you will have penile shortening if you take out too much um, penile urethra and rather plays a graft in that area. And then the bulbar urethra, there's an option of dilation, as Dr. Skokan was saying, and that uh, success rate goes down as, as the more treatments you get. So eventually, the, the right answer would be to get the patient into the operating room and do a urethroplasty. And then it really depends on how long that stricture is on what you do. If you cut the stricture out and sew the two ends back together, or if you need to place a graft and you can place it ventral or dorsal. Um, and then usually if they fail after urethroplasty, then you can do one more dilation or DVIU because that success rate can actually be higher than, than the ones that you get before treatment. In the case of uh, short strictures in the bulbar urethra, um, which is the most common that we see in the United States, the most common location we see here. So if the stricture is less than two centimeters long or less than about one inch long, you can cut it out and sew the healthy ends of the urethra before and after it back together because we're, there is some elasticity. So on the left side, the diagram showing the section with scar, black lines show what we are cutting out. And then we spatulate, so we cut into the the healthy tissue before and after so that we can sew a connection that's not a, a um, circle all at one location, but it's an oblong circle in case it narrows a little bit. It um, hopefully does not narrow to cause a recurrence. And then we sew that together with absorbable stitches. It's really important to use absorbable stitches because permanent stitches may let stones and foreign body collect and form on them. On the right side is one of our patients where we are doing an anastomotic urethroplasty. So you can see a catheter from uh, in the penis coming out through the distal stump, the stump here. And then down below is the stump that if you followed that, you would go into the bladder. And the next step is we're going to sew those two together. And then uh, recent, in the more recent years, a non-transecting approach has been described which has less complications, especially sexual side effects um, with erectile dysfunction after surgery. And in that case, it's also short stricture in the bulbar urethra. And you do not transect the urethra as you saw in the previous slide, but you cut into the dorsal side of the urethra. And the key for that operation, if you've never done it before, is to mobilize the urethra quite aggressively all the way to the penoscrotal junction, right, where the uh, where you can feel the urethra leaving the scrotum and going into the penis. That's where you want to mobilize it so you can look into the dorsal, onto the dorsal side, and then you make an incision dorsally and then cut out the scar. And then you sew in the mucosa, you sew the mucosa together in, in the lumen, and then eventually close the dorsal incision um, horizontally. You open longitudinally and then close it horizontally like a Heineken Michelitz fashion. Um, and that works really well for short bulbar strictures. It's nice because we're just cutting out the scar and not healthy deeper tissues, but it, it's definitely a technique adjustment. So it takes a few cases of getting used to um, because it's achieving the same thing as this approach, just with removing a little bit less tissue, only removing the scar and leaving the healthy tissue even at the level of the stricture. And if you would attempt something like this, but then don't feel comfortable with excising or you are surprised that, that it's maybe a longer stricture, you could always then go on to placing a dorsal buckle graft. This was one case uh, that Dr. Adai brought up, which was I think a 14 year old boy who had a long stricture involving the penis. So we can see on the x-rays, some of the penile urethra is okay. And near the base of the penis and through the rest of the bulbar urethra or through the distal bulbar urethra is a narrow stricture, probably best seen there. So kind of a penobulbar stricture and the rest before and after that is healthy. But that might be a couple inches or, or several centimeters long. And so what are some of the things we could do to address that? We could take a graft and use it to resurface 
that section of the urethra. And it's probably the most common way we'll tackle that in our practice here. Um, there are a couple alternative approaches that we'll talk about in similar cases, but we generally want to use a graft or alternatively a flap to, um, to patch the area of scar because it's too long to just remove and sew the ends back together. Mm -hmm. And this approach depends where it is in the penile urethra, but we can still approach it through a perineal incision and then get the penis exposed through that perineal incision. It's, it's basically um, delivered into the surgical field by, by um, mobilizing the attachments. And this is really nicely shown here. It's a Dr. Kulkarni from India has described this technique and we use it for these long penile strictures where you can mobilize the urethra dorsally. And the really important thing to remember is to not mobilize it all the way, but leave the one side of the attachments intact. So the blood supply to that urethra is still good. And then you open the urethra dorsally and lay in a dorsal graft and then sew the urethra back on. And then you can flip the penis back uh, into its normal anatomic position. And this shows the blue here is the, the diseased urethra. The, just to the right of that on the first image is the erectile bodies. So the penis is brought into field and we open the urethra and we see the erectile bodies. And then this white is the grafts from the mouth that are sewn onto the erectile bodies. And then the urethra is closed onto that to create a tube again, a tube with a larger, larger lumen. And you can see that, that this structure is so long that we needed to use two grafts, usually from each side of the inside of the mouth, um, from both cheeks. It's a long operation. So sometimes we do this together where a group works in the mouth and gets the harvest of the buccal graft and the other surgeon goes from below to speed up the process. And this is another case um, where you can see multifocal stricture disease. And, the, and what I would recommend in those um, cases, instead of doing that whole Kulkarni repair, I think I would focus on the areas that are flow limiting, or meaning that large caliber rings of scar don't matter, but you, because you could use another bilateral buccal graft on this patient. But I think I would focus on the areas that are really narrow. Um, and Dr. Skoken is showing the two. There's one that is, looks like penile urethra and may be difficult to excise at all. Maybe that will need a graft. Um, and then further down, and sometimes you will have to tell the patient they may have two areas of buccal graft. Um, and sometimes you're surprised because potentially in this case, you will focus on this most narrow um, part here. And once you open this area up and look down, you might be able to push the scope through all of this. And this, this area that looks narrow on the retrograde urethrogram here may actually be 16 French. And you might not have to do anything uh, to it. The other way that you could deal with this issue is to divert the urethra and avoid all of this. So in this patient, it's something, diversion might be something we considered because from what Dr. Adai reported, this patient had a lot of heart disease and other comorbidities, things that uh, make them chronically ill and might make them higher risk for a long procedure under anesthesia. So what you can do is to open the urethra um, behind the scar, so back here where it's wide open and healthy. We raise a U-shaped flap from the perineum, so that U-shaped flap is down on the left image down in the bottom with the anus just a little below that. And then we open up the urethra and then we sew that flap and the skin on the sides to the open urethra. And that's creating what's called a perineal urethrostomy. And then when the patient urinates, they will urinate from here. So we don't do anything with the urethra from here up into the penis. Just leave that be and create a diversion so they would need to sit to urinate, but are bypassing all the scar. This is on the table at the end of a surgery showing you what a perineal urethrostomy may look like. This is the opening with the catheter running through it. 
and a few stitch lines that the patient will heal over. And it's important to know that the incision into the urethra is ventral and not a circumferential mobilization of the urethra and bringing out the circumference of the urethra to the skin because that has a much higher likelihood of scarring down. So this is a technique that uses a flap and scrotal skin to make the scarring less likely. This is another case that Dr. Adai brought up of a patient who developed a, um, a urethral fistula, uh, excuse me, a urethral diverticulum, thank you, after a urethroplasty. And in this case, um, there was a bleeding event. The patient developed a hematoma um, and then developed this diverticulum a little bit after that. So there are a few reasons we may see diverticula develop. What I've seen most often is patients who had a skin flap um, to repair their urethra many years ago may come in with a diverticulum or an outpouching. And I have a photo of a patient of my own here who has an outpouching in his skin flap urethra. This is from Dr. Adai's case, but the images are from the patient I took care of. And um, maybe as, the, as people get older and the skin gets more laxity, more stretchiness to it, then that urethra is affected, the skin flap is affected in the same way, and that might lead to form a diverticulum. Or maybe a stricture has returned or a new the diverticulum. So the, the, that area of, is seeing um, pressure and is expanding in response to pressure. Or in this case, I don't know the whole story, but maybe the bleeding event caused some, some um, blood to accumulate and stretch the urethra. Or maybe the bleeding event was because part of the repair opened and then the patient healed with a small space around the urethra that became incorporated into it. I don't know which of those um, based on his time course, but ultimately he developed a pretty big diverticulum. And this is the skin, I think here, and here is the skin from a skin flap of his repair that has become part of that diverticulum. And so, um, there's a couple challenges with these cases. There's a pedicle or a blood vessels that come in to support that skin flap. And you really want to be careful that you don't disrupt that pedicle. So if you have old operative notes, it would be really helpful to refer to them and see, did this come from the right side, the left side? Did it come from skin on the scrotum, skin on the penis? To give you a good idea of where those blood vessels will come in. And then what we try to do is to open down directly onto the urethra. Um, and if we know where the pedicle comes in, to open a little bit towards the other side. So either go right in ventrally at six o'clock, or if the pedicle came down from the right side, maybe I go a little bit to the left side and enter, enter it ventrally. And then you can trim down some of the excess. So what we'll usually do, if this is in the bulbar urethra, is put in a catheter that's you know, a reasonable size. I don't know what would you have less? French, 20, maybe? Yeah. 18, 20 French. Yeah. Or a little maybe, bigger than a 16. Yeah. I think the last one I did was a 24 Four. for this. So something in the 20s mm -hmm. range, I think would be good because that's the native size of the bulbar urethra. And then you trim out the excess until you can recreate the tube over that catheter without stretching it. And again, if you want to make sure there's not stricture further out, because if there is, you need to deal with that. Otherwise, your diverticulum may come back. And I think one of the questions had been what size you need to calibrate to. And as Dr. Sukhoven said, we, we basically use the catheter as a guide um, to close that area over again. So you trim out excess away from the pedicle, if possible, and then close the urethra again. On the left is one of our patients before and then after surgery. And you can see we left, all, you know, we brought these two channels together, left some in place, but then trimmed down so that this is the area where the diverticulum was repaired. And this is a, most likely a pelvic fracture case. Um, that's how it looks like to me, um, where there was a big disruption of the urethra and that now you are left with a large segment that's missing. Um, and if you would <clears throat> reconstruct that urethra with um, 
excising the scar, um, you would most likely end up with some penile curvature because of how much you have to excise and how those ends need to be brought together. Um, and that really depends on how old the patient is and if they have sexual function. Um, you know, we see those long strictures sometimes in patients with who have had radiation. And in patients who had radiation, they might be older age and they might not have erections. They that it would be okay to do, and you could even plicate the corporal bodies to bring the you to kind of shrink everything down. But in someone who's young and who has a large defect, we have to think um, how we can bring that back together. And sometimes scar tissue excision and bringing the two ends back together might not be an option. So here are a couple ways we can bridge longer gaps. This example is probably more often used in the anterior urethra. So like in the bulb or in the penis. Um, but if you have an, a long area of scar, and especially where part of the scar is really dense, really narrow, or maybe even has closed off entirely, you can combine an anastomotic technique with a graft technique or a substitution technique in order to meet all the needs of that case. So this is called an augmented anastomotic repair. And what we do is cut out the area that's really badly diseased and sew half of the urethra back together. So we'll sew this end and this end back together, but we can't bring the whole tube back together without a lot of tension. So in order to recreate the tube after we sew together one plate, we, make a, uh, we take a graft and we secure it in place and then sew the urethra to that. So here we're doing a dorsal onlay where we're, that graft is on the erectile bodies and then we'll bring that up to complete the tube. And you can see here on the proximal urethral urethra, the spatulation is long because here on this image, you can see that the inlay of darker gray here, this looks like a normal urethra. And then where those dots start, the urethra is quite narrow and then completely obliterated. Um, so that's a nice way to preserve urethra if they're still lumen. And there are a few um, studies that have looked at the outcomes with this. And this approach, the outcomes are still good, 75% or higher, depending on the series. Not quite as good when we do those simpler techniques, but we use it really in complicated scars. So I think it's less of an issue that the technique is not as good and more that this technique is used for some of the really more complicated issues that you will see. And this is, you know, the, the, the imaging you saw earlier where there is quite a large defect. This is maybe the largest defect we've mm -hmm. kind of seen is, is from, what was it, pelvic fracture related? This, uh, I think so, yeah, and then yeah. They might have had, what sometimes can happen is if their blood supply gets disrupted during the pelvic fracture and you may attempt a urethroplasty and it might look good, it might all get together for, this, for the repair, but that patient is still at risk of stricture down the line if there's not good blood supply. So then, um, yeah, you, we're going to talk back about that. More. You, you then uh, um, have a problem with getting the two ends back together, just like you would see here. There's a 10 centimeter gap that you cannot bridge with that augmented urethroplasty. So in this case, and it's rare that we see big defects like this, but we need to be really creative with these. So this might be a case where you talk with the patient about forsaking their urethra and managing them with a suprapubic tube or creating a catheterizable channel so that they can empty their bladder and not worry about the urethra at all. Um, but one of the tools that we have used in a small number of cases um, is to work with our plastic surgeons who do microsurgery, uh, surgery on small blood vessels and nerves under a surgical microscope, where they can take a flap of tissue from somewhere else in the body, a free flap, where they um, most often take a strip from the arm with blood vessels and nerves attached to it, create a urethra out of that, roll it up into a tube. And generally, we do that over a catheter. So here's our tube of a free flap from the arm with its blood vessels. And then hook that up to blood vessels in the leg. Uh, 
and sew it to the urethra before, excuse me, before and after the area of uh, scar or obliteration. So this is a free flap urethroplasty, really big, heroic, complicated approach to dealing with the, the worst urethral strictures that we see. And even here, where patients get sent in from all over, this is pretty rare. This is, you know, I think a couple cases, period, that have needed this. And this is our plastic surgery colleague, Dr. Friedrich, who's a micro and hand surgeon here and works with us on many cases. And he helps us in these cases to do the microscopic connections between the new urethra um, arteries and an artery in the thigh and the veins in the new urethra and a vein in the thigh. Here's the patient afterwards, and they've healed up the urethra on the x-ray on the left. Maybe almost completely healed in that image at that time. And then the incision on the perineum to hook everything up, the incision on the leg to make the blood vessel connections, and then the incision on his arm once he's totally healed up. You can see we close that up completely on the first go when we just need to take a, enough to make a urethra, which is nice because it simplifies his recovery. So uh, stenoses or narrowing in the posterior urethra, we talked about this. There's two kind of groups we see in the United States often, and it's patients who had pelvic fractures with damage to the urethra or patients who had some form of treatment for prostate. So that most often is prostate cancer, but sometimes for benign growth of the prostate where they have some of the uh, partial prostatectomy or a TERP and then develop a stricture or a stenosis after that. Here in the United States, radiation therapy is also a common way to treat prostate cancer. And long-term after radiation therapy, patients can develop a stricture um, starting maybe around, we start to see it come up even as early as two years after surgery or after radiation, but the further out you get from radiation, the greater the risk of some of these issues coming up. And here we see some typical pictures of strictures that are uh, related to- Oh, initially you're uh, Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, okay. Uh, um, injuries to the urethra, I think from a pelvic fracture, actually. Um, and uh, this one, you can see there's still contrast flowing through the urethra and then up through the posterior urethra into the bladder. So it might not be a complete disruption in, in just some, some leak and a partial tear. Um, and then same uh, on this side where the, the, I think the extravasation of contrast is more than you can see here. Maybe this is just a stretch injury. And then here you see that there's uh, contrast extravasation, but most likely you will be able to get a catheter in because there's connection up high to the posterior urethra and then to the bladder. And then it gets really bad disruption injuries where the urethra fills, and then you can see contrast goes all over. Um, and it's hard to know if this is the bladder or not. It might be all disrupted. And the bladder sometimes can be full of contrast if the patient has gotten IV contrast and has extruded that. Um, through the kidneys. And so the bladder could be full of contrast. And you can see here, there might be no more attachment between the uh, membranous urethra and the, and the rest. And usually the prostate rides up high and the de defect we, can, we see is usually at the membranous urethra. Um, same here, where there is, I feel like, uh, totally, disrupted. totally disrupted, no more connection. You don't see the contrast going up into the bladder. So um, we do this once in a while here. We used to do this more often, but an early realignment of the urethra after a pelvic fracture, where we bring the two ends, the stump, when it's torn completely apart, we bring the stump on one end and the stump at the other end back together and put a catheter across it. And we used to think up until very recently that uh, a small number of patients, but some patients might actually heal their urethra open and not need a big surgery to repair scar if they heal up after an endoscopic realignment. We had a very recent study from across a number of different hospitals that looked at this question though and found that it didn't actually decrease the, right, the, the rate of surgery afterwards. We still do it once in a while because it might affect some of the other parts of a patient's care. Um, our orthopedics doctors 
sometimes won't do the repairs that they think is best for a pelvic fracture um, because they're worried about a suprapubic tube causing infection of hardware. And so in those cases, we might do this procedure still not because it will help the patient simplify our care, but because it means it may get the best, the, the best care that they need for their orthopedic injuries at that time. And then we can deal with the urethra once they're healed. Um, this is techniques for posterior. This is, this is a posterior urethroplasty. And those patients are young patients um, and you will operate close to the uh, geodiaphragm apex of the prostate. Um, so those patients can bleed quite a bit during their uh, surgery. So I think it's important to check their hematocrit, um, their hemoglobin before you start the operation and, and monitor it after. Rarely they need a blood transfusion because they they can bleed quite a bit um, from those surgeries. But basically what you do is go right to the geodiaphragm and you tr transect the urethra right where it enters the geodiaphragm. So all the bulbar sponges on the distal side that you can see um, right here, lift it up and then you're left with the urethra and usually a lot of scar in that area. And then you will carve out that scar and you should make that pretty wide and so you can see well. And then once you find the uh, urethra, and, and sometimes you need the help by looking antigrade through the bladder down. So the patient usually gets a suprapubic tube placed before surgery, and then you have, to have access to the bladder and look down or put a, a probe down uh, to feel that um, proximal end of the urethra because there's sometimes so much scar that you won't be able to find the other side unless you have guidance with either a, um, a sound or a, a, a cystoscope. And then once you have started removing all the scar, you put your sutures in and, and then sew the two ends back together. And there's no graft needed in, in those cases. There are a few additional techniques that sometimes help us to bridge the gap between the, the end of the urethra on the outside and the bladder and the end of the urethra attached to it. So the bulbar and the membranous urethra most often. Um, and I'll show you some images of these as well, but all the time we mobilize, so we free up the urethra from some of the attachments around it so we can use its elasticity to bridge the gap. Sometimes we need to split the corpora, which that means is that we separate the erectile bodies. We take the part that's fused together and we open it and create some space between that the urethra can run and travel a shorter distance. And I'll show you why that shortens the distance. Occasionally after we split the corpora, we also still have a gap and we need to cut out a little bit of the bone of the pubis in order to give ourselves even a little more of a straight shot. And rarely we need to take out the whole section of the pubis that sits between the urethra and the bladder. The last maneuver we can use is where we reroute the urethra around some of the anatomy to shorten its trajectory further and get the and bridge that gap. So here we see a diagram up top and an image down below from our this is from some of the surgical texts that just illustrate this really well because my pictures don't look nearly as clear. Um, but so on the top left, the erectile bodies are here. And then the, uh, the outer surface of the pubis is right here. And so this has been separated. All the erectile bodies were together all the way down to here, but that got separated out. We're gonna find the proximal stump of the urethra in here somewhere. And so we freed up, exposed that in, internal, or that the, the surface of the pubis. If there are blood vessels there, move them out of the way or separate them. And that's, we'd be looking at here, that plate of the pubis, the urethra down here, and then our distal stump out here. And this is a pubectomy. Yeah. This is this is exactly if you need more space, and it's all about getting enough space to be able to see and get all the scar out. So if you, after doing the corporal splitting, it's all an algorithmic um, pr uh, progress where you. First, split the corpora. First, you mobilize the urethra, then you split the corpora. And we usually do that early on if we know it's a posterior urethroplasty. We split the corpora early on, you palpate for the pubic bone, and then you continue dissecting. And then, if you 
your dissection runs into um, the deep areas and you can't see very well, then we go to our partial pubectomy. And there's bone instruments, a little chisel and a um, ranger that we use to, to open up some of the space by removing um, parts of the pubic bone. And um, uh, the symphysis is usually right there. So uh, that can be removed. Be careful, some of those patients have hardware because they might have presented with a complete disruption of their pubis and our orthopedic surgeons sometimes put in a plate. So you could run into that plate and then you would have to have your, your, your orthopedic surgeons there to remove it for you. Um, they can do that, but it's, it's good to know about that. And you should be able to see that on an x-ray. And once you expose, then there might be some bleeding. You will have to uh, you know, use cautery on the bone and, and then there's even more space. So splitting of the corporal bodies, why does that get you a shorter distance? Well, what we're doing, this dotted line here is the corporal body complex that's in the way between your urethra and the uh, prostate. So if you split them, you can run straight across that space. And so you can see that shortens the gap instead of running all the way down and then going back up, you can go straight in between them to get to the prostate. Pubectomy straightens that even further. So we've split, you know, in this case, we would have split all the way up to here. And then we see there's this bump of the pubis in the way. So if we chisel that away, we've got an even straighter shot to get up to the prostate. Then the last thing is rerouting. So we see the erectile bodies, the corporal bodies on either side, and we freed one up between that and the pubic bone, and we run the urethra straight across there. And it shortens the distance just even a little bit further. So this is the last move that we would do other than maybe opening up through the belly to approach from above and below. And this is only used and you only really need this in a small number of cases, but it is more common that you need to use all of these steps in children who've had uh, pelvic fractures than in adults who've had a pelvic fracture. And uh, the outcomes are quite good. Uh, especially the whole goal is to remove all the scar and the patients usually have not had any radiation. So they should be left with healthy tissue. And if there's no tension on your anastomosis, the, the uh, success rate is uh, up to 90%. Some patients will be incontinent uh, because of potentially pelvic floor disruption, sphincter disruption from the surgery that we do. And then um, they uh, may be incontinent and, and need an incontinence procedure, but um, that's rare. So the um, urinary incontinence is about 5%. And then because the rectum is really close in that area, there could be a rectal injury at the time of your dissection. Um, and then uh, lower extremity. Um, it's really important because those surgeries are long. They are maybe uh, five to six hours long, sometimes even a little longer. Uh, because of all the maneuvers and the scar that needs to be excised. Um, make sure you take the legs down out of that high lithotomy position at least every two hours. Um, and you can preemptively start that before you put your stitches in, take them legs down, wait for 20 minutes and put the legs back up to prevent nerve injury and compartment syndrome or muscle injury to the, those areas. This is another... Um really complicated case that Dr. Adai brought up. It's a, I believe it's a, uh, uh, an adolescent who had a pelvic fracture and a urethral injury. And then at one point in his recovery was found to have a fistula between the bladder or maybe the stump of the urethra and the intestines. And it might be that this patient had an injury to the intestines at the original time with his pelvic fracture and developed a fistula afterwards. Um, but just there weren't the tools to find that injury to the intestines at that time. Um, or maybe he would had a bad infection and developed an abscess and that, that created the fistula. I'd say probably the most common place where we see this is if somebody had injuries to both structures. And even if it's repaired, they're at very high risk of maybe developing a communication. So I think how you handle this really depends on where that fistula is. Um, I'd certainly 
here what we would do is work with our general surgeons um, where they we'd have them steer a little bit of managing the intestines and we'd steer a little bit of managing the bladder in coordination. Very big chance that the patient would get a, an ostomy, a diversion of the intestines so that they don't have stool going across the fistula site. And if it's on the bladder, um, that probably would, should get repaired separate from managing their stricture. So maybe you could do the stricture first. I don't know, I would probably fix the bladder first, the fistula, and then do the stricture. What do you, what do you think? Right, because I think if you do this big repair on the urethra and his bladder do doesn't heal, yeah. that's a problem. So I think focusing on fixing the bladder first and because those repairs could potentially, like Dr. Skoken said, break down again and continue having a fistula and the patient might be better off getting a diversion um, a, a little conduit potentially. Yeah. Um, you want to make sure that he has a good bladder or the patient has a good bladder before you then, um, go on to, uh, his urethra. So maybe an abdominal surgery to fix his bladder and then do a urethroplasty. Or if the fistula is around the urethra to the GI tract, you might have to tackle that all at the same time. And then maybe you would use a flap. So sometimes we'll take a flap of muscle, the gracilis from the leg, to help separate the space between the rectum and your repair on the urethra. And we do that for recto urethral fistulas after radiation therapy and other treatments after surgeries. And if it's abdominal and you separate the two and, and close the bladder, then it's always advisable to put omentum between the two areas to prevent refistulization. Yeah, tissues in between the two ends of the fistula is helpful. So this is something that's Oh. Um, that um, that is common with pelvic fractures. It's a pelvic ischemia or disruption of the blood vessels due to the injury. And um, we think that there is a um, higher risk of um, urethral stricture for those patients as well as failure after urethroplasty. Um, but we also know that many patients who suffer from a pelvic fracture have the disruption of the urethra and that's usually fixed first. And then there's a high percentage of patients and you're usually young patients uh, who have pelvic fractures that suffer from um, erectile dysfunction. And that is related due to uh, problems to the pudendal artery branches that supply blood supply to the dorsal artery and the bulbo urethral artery. And the erectile dysfunction um, is important to ask about because um, you want to make sure that you address that also for those patients. And what we do here, if someone has had um, a pelvic fracture with or without a urethroplasty or urethral injury, we then um, do an ultrasound on their penis to make sure that we can measure the blood supply. And we can usually see that their blood supply is diminished. And that's why they don't have uh, good erections. And then we uh, do an angiogram. At the, our interventional radiologists do that. And with that angiogram, we then can see the distribution of blood vessels. You can see that here in the lower area. And then from that, we counsel the patient on potentially undergoing a revascularization procedure. And that revascularization procedure, sorry, is done with our plastic surgeons. Um, and they do a microscopic um, anastomosis between a leg, uh, an artery from the leg to the dorsal artery of the penis or the epigastric vessel um, up in the abdomen. And those patients regain erectile function um, many times. Yeah, not all of them, but pretty good mm -hmm. for patients that are young and healthy. You know, when we've looked at it, maybe 65% will get back to um, better erections, either totally independent or maybe just using medication to help. That is more about where we might use a free flap, which we spoke about earlier. Oh, sorry, I have this in here twice. We wanted to talk about it. And then the last, this has been published on just a tiny bit. For long defects, sometimes you can also use a tissue substitution from a totally different side of the body. So there are one or two cases reported of using the intestines taking a section of intestines, tunneling it down all the way through the pelvic floor 
and using the, the intestine to connect to the urethra distally and the bladder or prostate further up. Um, I've not done that. I don't think that we've um, actually performed that here, but we have a couple peer institutions that have each done one or two. And I think I include it there as an interesting, you know, another approach, especially when like microsurgery for a free arm flap might not be feasible at some places, but you may do surgery on the intestines or have a general surgeon who does. So that might be a better fit with the resources that you have in very select, really challenging cases. That's everything that we had prepped. We very good cases from Dr. Adai. Yeah. Uh, very challenging ones and complex ones. We are open to any questions and you can also email us anytime. We would love to visit you someday and you can are always welcome here. Um, it's been a great pleasure and a privilege to be able to um, talk to you today. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure listening to you today. The exposition has been great. And at this point, maybe you invite questions from the floor. Yeah. yeah. If any of you have any questions, so, you can just unmute and go ahead and ask. If you have a new question, you can raise your hand. We will see. That's good. Okay, good. All right. Any question from the floor? Dr. Roland, are you there? Yes, I'm around. Great, great. Good. Any comments uh, or questions? Uh, I first want to thank uh, Alex and Judith. Uh, for this wonderful exposition. And uh, in fact, the collaboration is so great between Alex and Judith. We, we so much like it. That's Thank great. You. I have a, uh, but the handling that is in the posterior distraction. So one of the complications Judith mentioned is a rectal injury. You said about 2% of them. I wanted to know how, how did they handle this when they discovered this intra-op? Speaking about erectile dysfunction yeah. after they've recovered? No, rectal injury. Oh, rectal injury. Rectal injury, yes. Yeah, yeah the erectile yeah. dysfunction would be more like, I would say, 60, 70% maybe, yeah. but the erectile injury, you're right. I've been... About, about 2%, yeah, from what exactly. you gave. And hopefully, you're, hopefully you have a suspicion that you're close to the rectum at the time of the surgery. And sometimes I had to do a rectal exam in the middle of the case because I was worried that I would, was getting too close. And for all those posterior urethroplasties, it's good to feel the rectum and, and put, usually I've put an extra glove on and, and do a rectal exam at the time when you dissect to just see where the rectum is and you are so close to it. It's, it's quite surprising how close you are. And then if you are really worried, I think having the general surgeons assess with a scope or um, I think they'd inject some air or water. Yeah. yeah, or you can inject some betadine. Sometimes we'll do that or air. To see um, if you have an injury. And see if it, you put it into the rectum, into the anus and see if, if you fill it up with a, a syringe full of betadine and put a gauze into your field. Do you notice any any betadine, iodine soak through? Do you see any brown from that soak through? And you know, luckily, I have not had an injury to the rectum yet during those procedures. Um, but I think if it happened, I would be very worried about closing that injury and and closing the urethra without without an interposition flap. Uh, you know, those patients are not radiated usually if they are pelvic fracture ones, if they are, you know, and if they have radiation, I would definitely, that patient needed to be diverted um, and get a, a, a colostomy, colos, colos, yeah, exactly, colostomy, colostomy yeah, exactly, mm. um, because then the risk of fistula is so high, but in someone with a pelvic fracture, if you feel like it's a small injury to the rectum, I think you could make the argument 
you know, talk to your general surgeons and maybe they can go get away with primary closure. But then I think something in, interposing between your repair and that rectum. And the only thing I can think of that's robust enough would be a gracilis flap from the thigh, which, right? Yeah. Scope yeah. In. It hasn't happened, luckily, but I think the best thing would be to just notice it because I think patients can be, get really sick if you don't notice it at the time of surgery. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Can I make a comment on that? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah, I've had two instances of uh, rectal perforation or rectal injury during this posterior distraction repairs. And how did you and handle them? In all the two cases, we recognized them at the time of death. We recognized them, and so we closed them primarily and uh, put the patient on neoperox for like three days. Uh, we didn't need to do any on, on, What did you put them on? One of them had a bad second one. Uh, Nail per ox, they, they, we didn't feed them for three days. Ah. We just put them on par. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So no bowel Parental nutrition, for yeah. Yeah. And, and right. you know, okay. Right. No fact, actually, actually we, I put I, I put I put them on a emodium. Is it no? Is it uh, something to oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. as to, it were to, cause constipation? To constipate them, yeah. <laughs> the primary, something like that. You constipate them, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and, and you did not have a fistula. And uh, one had a bad infection, but we got, we got, no, 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 there was no fistula at all. Good, 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 good. Yeah, I think in those patients mm. with pelvic fracture, the good thing is that they are healthy mm. and young and have good blood supply, so I could see it healing. Mm -hmm. I think somebody put up a question in the chat. If you can read the chat. Oh, let's see. Um, Mary Mani asked, said, thank you for the presentation. Why is it more common to go through all the techniques necessary for gaining a shorter route to the prostate in children compared to adults? That's a great question. I don't know that we know completely. You know, my theory, when I just think about it now, is that it has to be to do with anatomy, right? And in a child, the only difference I can see really is the prostate is very small. Bet that the GU diaphragm prostate apex is maybe higher in them. Before, so in young children, the bladder is an abdominal organ too. Um, and it so descends both of those, further, yeah. yeah. And then around puberty, we see significant, you know, some significant growth of the prostate. Um, and so it probably is that it's a combination of a couple of those things in a prepubertal versus an, you know, an adolescent late teenager who's probably closer to an adult. And I have uh, Dr. Skok and I, we did a rerouting on a patient. Um, he was four years old. Um, and we needed to do all these things to bring the urethra back together. And it's probably because of that higher riding prostate, I think. Very good question. I have a question. Uh, that, that this anatomy in children make uh, the outcomes any worse in children with posterior distraction injuries, uh, defects, you know, I think their their outcomes are probably still pretty good. Um, those pelvic fractures, I think, are much more rare in children. We don't see as many children with pelvic fractures. Yeah. Um, you know, mostly here the patients are in their early twenties to thirties, maybe forties, who got into motor vehicle accidents, by uh, motorcycle accidents. That's the most common case we see. Um, that other patient I talked about, he was a, that was a pedestrian versus car accident, but we see them much more rare. Um, I don't think the anatomy makes it 
um, I think those and those those other things we need to do is corporal splitting, pubectomy, rerouting might be more common, but then they should heal the same as, as someone who is older. They have good blood supply, hopefully, still. Yeah. Another question. I ask this chat. question because, I ask this question because uh, in my readings, I was trying to make a publication on posterior distraction injuries. And in my studies, I came across this uh, concept of the underdeveloped prostate kind of having the urethra, having the effects on urethral vasculature in a way that makes it look like uh, it's more difficult for children uh, than adults. For which reason I even had to separate my data into children and then adults, but I'm here to publish it actually. I think it yeah makes sense. Yeah, yeah. We'll it definitely forward, makes sense. Yeah. We'll look forward to seeing um, your your study and outcomes from it too. That'll be a great addition. Great. Okay. Absolutely. In the chat, we have another question. Is it is it possible to identify the external sphincter during initial and redo surgeries? I think if you're going to see it you're more likely to at the time of initial surgery. Sometimes there's a lot of scar and it's really difficult to see the sphincter. I think I've most often found it in posterior urethra when we're doing a, um, a surgery after a TERP, after a surgery on the prostate for benign growth, because the TERP will affect the inside, but not necessarily around the urethra. But with a pelvic fracture, it really just would depend on how much scar, how much bleeding was around the sphincter and how much scar is there. Um, after a revision, it probably would be very difficult to see. Um, I certainly, in the revisions that I have seen, have not been able to reliably identify it. Mm -hmm. And then you, I think, would use maybe the pelvic floor, the geodiaphragm as your landmark. But there have been public uh, one, at least one publication that talks about sphincter sparing urethroplasty, and I have not done that myself. If I get to that place, I usually transect that urethra. It's hard. It's, very it's really hard. difficult, and yeah. I don't know how well that sphincter does once you dissect it free, and yeah, I, I don't know, but I think they, you could actually see it enough to spare it initially. Good question. discussing urinary incontinence from the intervention. So it depends on the disease state. After a pelvic fracture, if the nerves to the bladder itself and the internal sphincter, the muscles in the bladder are not affected, then the, that will keep the patient continent. So the incontinence rates are low, maybe 5% or so. Yep. After radiation therapy, there are other factors with how the bladder works. So the incontinence rates there if the prostate is still in place are around 15% and much higher if the prostate has been removed. And or, or terped. Or terped, or, yes. yeah, or, or shaved out. And in people who do get a urinary incontinence, the most common way that we treat that long-term here, if they have a lot of leakage is to put in a permanent implant um, called an artificial urinary sphincter. And it's a hydraulic fluid device that um, goes around the urethra and gently squeezes it closed and acts kind of like the native sphincter. Um, but they can be, it's, it's a higher risk to put that in after a urethroplasty because their blood flow has been disrupted and they may not have as good, they may have some breakdown of the urethra itself. Um, so, uh, so that's something to keep in account. We take those case, cases really cautiously. Hmm. Great questions. Ashley, thanks so much for organizing. Yes, if everybody's done asking questions, I just want to thank uh, you, Dr. Hagedorn and Dr. Skokan for your time today. And Dr. Adai for, for helping coordinate this lecture. It was, it was great. It was great to meet with you all.
Thank you again for your time and for sharing some of your experiences as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Right, thanks, everyone. Have a great evening. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.